Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. For those that are watching on Facebook Live, we want to welcome you, of course. But just to kind of get a sense of what's happening in this room, you can hear there's an echo in this room. And uh, so this week, all of the carpeting was, old carpeting was removed. And uh, you might be able to see, especially if you're watching on Facebook Live, the new carpeting. This is the new carpeting up here. So that's kind of a preview of what you will be seeing in the rest of the uh, space by next Sunday. And uh, I've kind of put some carpet here just to kind of uh, make it look a little bit nicer this morning. So we're about two-thirds of the way through uh, our renovation project. So uh, there's quite an echo today. I probably don't even need to have a mic to speak. It's pretty amazing. And uh, you were very loud in your conversations today because uh, the rug will the absence of the rug will do that. So, but we're here to worship today, so the singing, we should never sound any better than we will this morning as far as singing. So let's stand, and uh, we're going to sing two worship songs and do some special things this morning. saves you when he makes you new and uh, this next song reminds me of that verse um, all the time of the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and just joining in 
the chorus of all creation to praise our Lord, to bless his name, to honor him and glorify him with all that we've been given in his name, in his son's sacrifice.
Let's take a moment to pray this morning. Father, we have sung from our hearts today that your name is holy. You are the one that we want to bless and to honor and to show our respect to, to adore. So Lord, that is our heart desire today. Lord, receive our worship. Thank you that for each person in this room, in this building, for those that are joining us online today, that we might be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, that is our desire today. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today is Step Up Sunday, so we are going to go and take just a few moments to go and uh, recognize our children as they're promoted to one grade to the next grade. So, Jerry, come on up and... Ooh. Wow! <laughs> you can hear me now. I think I'm gonna move back. Okay, so, so the people, nobody heard us. Okay, so welcome to Step Up Day 2021. We are here to celebrate the children of UBC. Next Gen Ministry Vision is as part of our commitment to God to care for and make disciples. UBC Next Gen Team will partner with parents and families and the church body to influence, challenge, and train the upcoming generation to have wonder for who God is, to discover what God has done for them, and to have passion in their design purpose and role in God's big story. We have two, there are two influences in child's life is much better than one. We partner with parents to help children to make wiser choices and develop stronger relationships with one end in mind, a deep personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. That way, they have a firm foundation when they leave the nest. Who does Next Gen Ministry reach? We have 16 families that we reach out to every week, 30 children, and 55 souls are impacted by our efforts every week. We are taught that children have four stages in life and each one of them have a purpose. Nursery, which is zero to two years of old age, the purpose is to know they are loved and they are welcomed here. Our Wonderoos, which is three years old to kindergarten, their purpose is to move kids to love God by inciting wonder of a loving creator who pursues restoration of a broken world. The basic truth that they learn is God loves me. Jesus wants to be my friend forever, and God made me. 252, our elementary, which is first through fifth grades, the purpose is to move kids to love life by provoking discovery of a living savior who gave his life so that those who trust in him can be rescued. The basic truth they learn is I should treat others the way that I want to be treated. I need to make wise choices, and I can trust God no matter what. Every month, they focus on a characteristic of God that they can emulate. 
middle schools and high school. The purpose is to move teens to love others by fueling passion of believers empowered by God's spirit to continue his mission and message. What's their purpose and how can they serve? I want to ask Megan, our UBC Kids Director, to come up. Welcome everyone. I'm Megan, the UBC Kids Director. Um, so we partner with the parents, um, but how? So besides Sundays, we, we send lots of emails, text messages, Facebook messages. Um, we also have a private Facebook group uh, for the parents and the kids. And we also do pr printed parent cues on Sundays. And these give the parents ideas or cues of ways to include God and their kids' lessons in their everyday lives. Um, and we also have offered the free parent cue app for the parents as well. Um, but at this time, we're going to pause our Facebook Live and YouTube streaming for the privacy of our children and families.
you'll go to your new classes. Okay, Leah uh, and Amelia. I don't know if Amelia will want to go upstairs and have some fun. We'll try it out. All right, so thank you, Miss Megan. So, as you have probably noticed, our numbers are significantly down from our last step up day in 2018. But that's for multiple reasons. We've had families that are uncomfortable to come due to the virus. We have, as you saw, many parents who are attending Zoom, and some don't attend church at all anymore. But the harder truth is that in the last few years, we've had families leave the church and start attending other churches who have a more active children's and youth ministry. We can attract more families and grow until we have more people step up as volunteers, which we have been praying for for years. And I realize it's God's timing. What I want to touch your hearts about is to look at the world around you. There's no more waiting. Now is the time to influence our families. So I urge you to search your hearts and get involved in making more disciples for Christ. As you'll see up there, we have an urgent need for children's check-in, which we need three. Nursery needs four. Wonderoos needs two leaders and four helpers. 252 needs three. GPS needs three. And youth group needs three. So I want to thank you guys for participating in 2021 Step Up Day. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Okay, we're going to go and turn to our sermon time. So for those on Facebook Live, welcome back to our service. And uh, if you would open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is where we're going to be this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and beginning in verse 16 is where we're going to begin today. In 2002, in this very spot, I preached a sermon one morning that was entitled, Let's Become an Enthusiastic Baptist Church. And it was based on 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The following Saturday, I was in my office, my previous office as an associate pastor, and Bob Finch came in, as he did every Saturday morning, and uh, he was the janitor here in our church for decades. And so every Saturday morning, he would come to clean the church. And on this particular Saturday morning, he brought me something. He brought me a gift. And he said, uh, we've made this for you this week. And uh, so it is an outline of a, of a church. And in the small writing here, it says, Enthusiastic Baptist Church, a.k.a. UBC. So this has been in my office for the last 19 years and uh, will continue to be there. And so over the last few weeks, I've been, uh, as Bob and Barb have been sick and now they've passed away in the last two weeks, uh, I've been thinking a lot about that gift and uh, what a wonderful gift it was. So the word enthusiastic, what is, what is that word? The, the word enthusiastic actually comes from a Greek word, and this Greek word is not used in the New Testament, but it is a Greek word, and uh, there it is on the screen for you. And it basically uh, is in God, is what the word means. And you can see that E-N is in, and then the T-H-U-S is uh, from Theo, God, in God. Or the heart possessed by a God. So it's a secular word. It can, it's not just a Christian word. And, but to be enthusiastic is a heart possessed by a God. Now what does that mean? It, it means that a person is maybe full of love or full of joy or full of passion, full of excitement. That's enthusiasm, as, as if a God is living in that person. So that's the official definition of enthusiastic. But enthusiasm is a heart word. When you're enthusiastic, you're living, you're living from the heart. There's that passion, that excitement, a strong uh, uh, excitement for a particular subject or a particular topic. So it could be sports, right? People are oftentimes very enthusiastic with a sports team. 
uh, last Sunday afternoon, uh, I have a friend, and she uh, runs a, a retail business down on the coast. And uh, she was noting this week that early in the afternoon, last Sunday afternoon, that it was very busy. The store was very busy with lots of customers. And then all of a sudden, all the customers went away. And she was like, where did everybody go? And she's like, not a single person came in. And then all of a sudden she was like, oh, the Patriots must be playing a game. And that was the case. And so in New England, sports fans, right, we can be very enthusiastic. And so it could be sports. It could be politics. It could be some hobby that you have that you're very enthusiastic about this hobby, that you invest a lot of time or money. And so you're very passionate uh, it could be of any interest or, or, or concern that you have that you're enthusiastic on this particular topic. And so, but for Christians, when we think about being enthusiastic, it is that we are experiencing the love and joy and passion that comes from God himself. For a Christian, enthusiasm is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us that excitement and passion to serve the Lord and to do other things for the Lord. Uh, we sometimes, we use the term, right, that, wow, that Christian is on fire for the Lord. That's the enthusiasm that we're talking about today. In Ephesians 6, 7, we'll put it on the screen, Paul writes to Christian workers, and he says, serve wholeheartedly. Serve from the heart. Serve with excitement and passion as if you are serving the Lord, not people. Because these people, they had harsh um, bosses. And so he says, no, serve with your whole heart. Serve enthusiastically. Some of the English translations of this verse will say that serve enthusiastically as if you are serving the Lord, not people, your physical boss wholeheartedly, enthusiastically. So let me ask you a question as we begin. At what point in your life were you most enthusiastic about serving God? At what point in your life were you the most enthusiastic about serving the Lord? You say, well, yeah, today, this week, oh, it's been a while. Uh, it's been a decade or more. It's been 30, 40, 50 years ago, that I would say, oh yes, there was a time that I was really on fire for the Lord. I was really enthusiastic, but not so much anymore. Now, a follow-up question. How would you rate your enthusiasm for serving God at the present time? As enthusiastic? Or maybe more, it's like, well, I have a lot of apathy these days, which is the opposite of enthusiasm. Now, before we go any further, I would like to dedicate my sermon today to Bob and Barb Finch and to Sharon Carroll. These two friends, three th friends that have served in the church here for a long time, these three people were enthusiastic about serving the Lord. Bob and Barb in serving in the Alpha Ministry years ago, or the Thursday afternoon community youth group that they did for many years, or in more recent times, the trunk or treat outreach that they were leading. And for Sharon, she was enthusiastic in a very different way, but she was very enthusiastic in hugging everybody that was in sight, right? And most of you, at one point or another, even if you were new, if you've only been here a week or two, that she hugged you. She was a hugger, and she was enthusiastic about hugging everybody, and she never met a person, a stranger, that was not a friend to her. That was just, that was how she served the Lord, and she did that very enthusiastically. And so I'd like to dedicate this time today to these three individuals. So let's go and look more closely at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. may not be all familiar to us very, very much, but what is the context here? The context is that in the city of Jerusalem, there, had, there was a great famine. And because of this famine, 
Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, were going hungry because they didn't have enough food. Uh, they had lost their income because of this famine. They, they couldn't grow crops and, and sell crops and so forth. And so Paul had sent out a challenge to all of the Christians in the whole known world of the Roman Empire, take, please take a special offering, a financial offering, and we will collect it, and I will personally take it to the believers in Jerusalem, and I will present them this special gift. So the word, word had gone to the church at Corinth, and so they were very excited. They were enthusiastic. Oh, we're going to do this. But some time had gone by, months probably, and their 100% enthusiasm because he tells us, Paul tells us this in verse 7 of chapter 8. What does it say in verse 7? Let's start with uh, verse 6. He says, So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. Titus was going to be sent to the church at Corinth to kind of get them um, activated again as far as taking this special gift. But verse 7, so it says, Sin but since you excel in everything, uh, the Corinthians were known for that, right? They, they were like, oh, we excel in everything. Whatever they did, they did like 100%. And so what does Paul say again in verse 7? But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, this complete earnestness is in, in enthusiasm. It can be translated that way. That's that word. Enthusiasm. You're, you have 100% enthusiasm. Uh, you're 100% you're behind going and taking this special offering. But something's happened. You, you were at 100% a few months ago, but now you've waned in your enthusiasm. And now you're at the opposite. You've gone and you're, you're, you're apathetic. You you're just have apathy about this whole, and you've kind of forgotten all about it. You've moved on to something else. So that's kind of the context of this. They had this great passion. The Corinthians were known to be a very emotional people. They were, you know, very excitable. Yes, we're going to go and do this. But it had waned. So let's come over now to verse 16. So Paul continues to write in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, Thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern. Concern is this word that can be translated enthusiasm. He says, I have this enthusiasm that you are going to do something great when you go and take the special offering. And Titus has the same enthusiasm that it's like, oh yeah, the Corinthians, they are going to go and do a great thing. That's verse 16. It's thanks be to God who put into your heart of Titus the same enthusiasm I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we're sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service of the gospel. Who is this person? We don't know. We don't know who it is. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe Barnabas, because Barnabas goes with Paul uh, to Jerusalem. But the scholars don't know. It could be some representative from the church of Macedonia. Now, we haven't talked about the church of Macedonia yet. But we'll talk about that in a moment. So we don't know. So let's continue with the text. So we're sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service of the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany, accompany us, so we carry the offering which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show your eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift, this great gift, for we are taking pains to do which is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. In addition, we're sending with them our brother, who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous. There, that's the word enthusiasm. 
He, he has this enthusiasm. And now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and in honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. Verse, chapter 9, verse 1. There is no need for me to write to you um, uh, about this service to the Lord's people, about this special offering. I've already done that. For I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. So, so get this. So at the beginning of this project, the Corinthian Christians, they had, as I said, 100% enthusiasm. Yes, we're going to go and do this. We're going to provide this great gift. And Paul had used them as an example to the churches in the region of Macedonia. And the churches in Macedonia had gone and got very excited, and they were now at 100% enthusi with enthusiasm to go and collect this gift. And they did. They collected this huge financial gift. And Paul tells us that these people are dirt poor, and they gave 100% of what they had and even more. Now, how is that even possible? You can't give more than 100%. So what is Paul saying? They gave sacrificially. They were so excited. They did it with passion. They did it with enthusiasm. And what's going to happen when they hear, because a representative from their group is going to come with me soon to your city, and we're going to read that in a moment, and you're going to be very embarrassed, very ashamed. Let, let's continue with the text. Let's read a couple more verses. He says, But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed, would be embarrassed for having been so confident in the beginning. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous, uh, a, uh, generous gift and not as one grudgingly given. So he says, you know, you're going to have egg all over your face because, you know, you are so confident. It's like, we're going to do this great gift, and then you've done nothing. So that's, that's the, the text that we look at today, and we looked at 19 years ago, and we discover that we are to be an enthusiastic church. We're to be an enthusiastic Baptist church, and that's what this reminder is all about, and what I spoke on some 19 years ago. Now, there are two types of Christians in this matter of enthusiasm. One is those who lead, who let their environment dictate their enthusiasm. They allow their environment to dictate their enthusiasm. So if the situation is not going well, if the environment is not conducive to being excitable, then enthusiasm just wanes. Now, whether that was the case in the Corinth church or not, they were probably just focused on other things. But the other option, the other type of Christian in this regard is those who let their enthusiasm dictate their environment. They let their enthusiasm dictate their environment. They become influencers and leaders. And so here's the takeaway we'll put on the screen. The influencer spreads enthusiasm far and wide. The influencer spreads enthusiasm far and wide. So being a leader or an influencer, that enthusiasm, they're just so enthusiastic that it just, in spite of whatever, whatever the environment might be, 
they just spread that everywhere. And so it becomes very contagious that people all around them become very passionate and enthusiastic. Now, let me tell you this true story that I read uh, recently. And the story is about a, I don't know how old of a young man, maybe 9, 10, 11 years old, and a Christian young man, and he lives in a poor section of a major city in the, in, in the United States. And so his environment would be very challenging. And so he determined that he wanted to someday go to college, to have an education when he was older, and no money, his family doesn't have any money, no, no source of money. So he decided that he was going to start looking for some kind of work and job. And so he decided to purchase a small hot dog cart. And uh, if you've ever seen our popcorn maker at our church that we use like, for the block party or something like that, it kind of looks like that. And I wish I had the picture of it. It had wheels. And so he decided he was going to sell hot dogs on the street corner in his neighborhood to raise some money for his college fund. So he started doing that. And it was a big hit. And, but the second part of doing this is he wanted, and quote, he wanted to put, I wanted to put smiles on the faces of all of my neighbors. That's what he was really enthusiastic about. Yes, he wanted to raise some money for his college fund, but he wanted to put smiles on everybody's faces because it's a really challenging environment, a very challenging neighborhood where people are typically not, you know, smiles on their face. So he did that. The, his business was a, was, a, was a great success. And then one day, somebody reported him to the city officials. And so the city officials came to investigate. He didn't have any permits. He didn't have a license to go and sell hot dogs on the street corner. And so as you can imagine, and sometimes as government officials can do, they were about to throw some major, a major bucket of water on this, of the enthusiasm of this young boy. But their conclusion, and let me see if I can read it for you. He says, this is the city of, uh, authority, he says, we will help this young man get all the needed permits because he is not complaining about his life and his environment. Instead, he wants to make his life better and he is also trying to make the lives of the people around him better. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's being, in, here's this 10 or 11 year old boy that's having this major influence on the people of his neighborhood, including the city officials. It's like, we can't shut him down. He is so enthusiastic. He is really doing this thing, and he's a great leader in doing so. So, did this young man allow his environment to dictate his enthusiasm? Did he allow himself to become a victim? to be pessimistic, there's like nothing I can do to change my life or my neighborhood? No, not at all. Instead, he has this enthusiasm to dictate his environment, to become that influencer, that leader. So when was the last time that you were enthusiastic about serving the Lord? If in the first question this morning that you said, well, it's, it, maybe it's not right now. When was the last time that you were enthusiastic about reading and studying the Word of God? Or prayer? Or coming to a worship service? Or attending a Bible study? Or a small group? Or leading someone to Christ? Now remember, as I ask you those questions, that enthusiasm is not self-generated as the Christian. It is something that comes by way of the Holy Spirit. As I said earlier, let me remind you, you are experiencing the love and joy and passion and excitement that comes from God himself. Your enthusiasm is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the final question would be today, are you connected to the Holy Spirit? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit of God to bring that passion into your life, that excitement, that joy, that love, that only he can provide. Now, originally, my thinking was this go was going to be a one 
time standalone sermon just for this week. But I've decided that there's enough material on this topic that I want us to talk a little bit further about this, and so there'll be a short sermon series in the coming weeks, and let's uh, be in enthusiastic. And so next week we're going to come back and look at the example of a Bible character that went from being very enthusiastic to having great apathy and the trouble this person got into because of apathy. Apathy in a Christian or a Christian family or a local church is always very dangerous. Because anytime you're living a life of apathy, you got to watch out. And many times that's where we live. So are we going to live in a life of apathy or in a life that we live in enthusiasm, living under the control of the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to be passionate, allowing us to be passionate about serving the Lord and all the things of the Lord. So let's take a moment to pray and then we're going to sing a song and we'll, we'll be done with our service this morning. Lord, we cry out to you as we have many times in the past. Lord, we are prone to wander. We are prone to wander from you, to lose that deep connection with you and your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, any time that happens, one of the aspects of our life, that enthusiasm will wane, it will fade, and apathy will set in. So, Lord, we invite you, even this day and this week, to rekindle our fire. Because as the Lord Jesus said to the church in the book of Revelation, I would rather you be either hot or cold and not lukewarm, because lukewarm water is only spit out of our mouths. So, Lord, I pray today that we would be known as people that are hot on fire for the Lord, that we would be the enthusiastic Baptist church. God, that is my prayer, and I pray it would be the prayer of all of us in this room and listening to my voice today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask you to stand. We are going to sing a song together. If all I had was Christ, I'd have nothing to gain all I have is Christ and I have everything his presence is enough he hides me in his way he wraps me in his love he stirs my heart Keeps his 
be seated. Let me share with you a couple of announcements. Next Sunday, we are going to be having our UBC growth track. If you are interested in becoming a church member, uh, if you have interest in being baptized, this soon will be ready for baptisms again, that this is uh, the class for you, and it'll be meeting right after church next Sunday morning. Uh, or if you just want to know more about the church, you're new to the church, you have questions, that would be the time for you to do that. Uh, in just a few moments, we're going to have a special church business meeting right in this room. And uh, so anybody can uh, stay and be part of the meeting, but you have to be an official church member to actually vote. And uh, so there will be uh, a vote on the topic today. So let me read the call to... The meeting, let me see if I can find the paperwork here. Here we go. Petition for special business meeting at the request of six members listed below. I call for a special business meeting to be held on Sunday, September 19th, 2021 for the purpose of discussion and vote on a proposal to remove the church pews or some of the church pews and replace them with chairs in the worship center. Jerry Vidala, church clerk. So that will be happening right after this meeting. So we are going to say farewell to our friends on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us today. And may you have a great week and uh, the Lord's blessings on you.